Reunion is the culminating moment the arc has been heading towards since late in the first season. After all of the hinting, foreshadowing, and teasing of what was to come, nothing is the same when this one is over. It's a game-changing episode, one of the most important in the series, and for sure, a stunner. Even if it is also a marker in the season that, for reasons having nothing to do with the episode, I look forward to on rewatches with both apprehension and excitement. I think I've just come to realize that my feelings about the episode are a little complicated. The greater scheme, the big picture. Right. After the bombshell cliffhanger from the previous episode, Gunn has found Angel and brings him back to the Hyperion. Angel brings the gang up to date on what has happened with Darla. She's dead and then resolves to save Darla from the fate of turning into a vampire again, setting off the quest of the episode. As we come back from the credits, Gunn pulls short straw exposition duty, bringing anyone who doesn't know these characters from Buffy up to date. What I'm saying is that means the granddaughter remade the grandmother. Man, somehow that weirds me out more than the whole blood sucking thing. Yep. It's that big old sexual subtext of vampirism. We also covered Darla and Angel's deeply Oedipal relationship in the video for Dear Boy. Darla once breastfed Angel into existence. Drew then did the same thing to bring Darla back to the vamp side. It's a whole breastfeeding thing, I guess? The apartment Lindsay invited Angel into a day earlier is now spotless. A real estate agent comes in and says that the place has been listed for sale already, and the moving truck had been there hours after Angel and Lindsay's conversation in the trial. The realtor gives Angel the clues to find the location of Darla's rising. She spent hours in my garden in Sunnydale communing with the night sky. I like the volume of information packed into that statement. He's referring to the mansion in Sunnydale that he, Spike, and Drew moved into after Giles set the warehouse on fire in the episode Passion, and he refers to it as his garden that Drew used to spend time in, even though at that point the name was Angelus. He could be using the term my for the mansion, referring to his time in season three, but Drew wasn't there. Team Angel susses out that Drew may mean a plant nursery Wolfram and Hart are connected to. Large firm like theirs, they may do business with a corporate supplier. Minorist of nitpicks, but the mention of corporate supplier cutting to this tiny rooftop greenhouse always feels dissonant. If the last episode raised a question as to whether Lindsay was acting on his own or under orders, having Darla rise in the presence of Lila and Holland seems to clear things up. They depart before Angel arrives. Angel goes to stake Darla, but Drew fends him off long enough for... CPR. You have to do it. I have no breath. You know, I really want to stop noticing every time that line of angels and prophecy girl gets contradicted beyond the fact that vampires can talk but i hear him say it in my head every single time a scene like this happens all right new head cannon and i'll be fine angel was breathless with sadness over buffy's death i'm not fine it didn't work darla is awake and feeling uh refreshed. Nice visual to immediately establish any hint of her previous illness is now gone. We get an interesting fight with a little vampire super jumping, one of those abilities I always wonder about when it's missing. Angel hesitates on the staking. Angel? Angel? And Darla takes her own leap of faith off the building. Angel returns to HQ and calls for a Wolfram and Hart assault. Cordy and West try to advocate for a plan, while Gunn... You had me at everyone gear up. Let's go. As much as his complete lack of worry regarding his own self-preservation should be a bit of a warning sign, his willingness to always back Angel up is pretty endearing. Angelus is on his way here now. Angelus is on the way, bit of foreshadowing for where the episode is going to go. Darla shows up to take Drew out on a girl's night. The powers send Cordelia a vision of someone in jeopardy. Their attempt to divert Angel from his path. Angel acts surly about it, and Cordy doesn't take it well. He then Jay turns in the middle of the street, and I guess Charisma's stunt double was out sick that night? The person in question is a young devil worshipper, not the usual fare for Team Angel, and Angel won't be distracted. The positive B must have had a good reason for sending us here. I don't have time to figure that out. Holland encourages Darla and Drew out on a massacre, and Angel breaks in to find their location yeah. while moralizing at Holland. You set things in motion, and people die. And yet, I just can't seem to care. So many lives hanging in the balance, waiting for their champion to save them. He's 
shadow. A faceless champion of the hapless human race. A true champion who's got it all. Let's give a special welcome to a true champion. Kamal said that he was going to be my champion. That's why she needed a champion. Where would this tribunal take place? Of course, now she's going to have to face the judgment with no champion. Where is your champion? You have no coat of arms and no champion. You have no champion. Yes, he does. The champion is defeated. In any case, you may want to hurry. So many lives hanging in the balance waiting for their champion to save them. Holland has Angel escorted out of the building by the police, and I don't know why, but I'm actually kind of happy to see Kate. Kate has perhaps been rethinking her approach with Angel since Shroud of Ramon, behaving reasonably here for the first time this season, and sending Angel after Darla, reasonably compared to the rest of the season. Drew and Darla crash Holland's party looking... Man, those are... Those are some fancy new threads, and I'm a little surprised that Wolfram and Hart's head of special projects doesn't himself have better security, given the class of clientele they're used to dealing with. Drew and Darla ate Holland's wife after an invite in, and his expression reads as, for the first time all season, having a lack of control over the situation. There's a kind of a cool effect here, where Drew and Darla both go vamp face in the same shot. Ordinarily, Buffy vs. Green Screen can be a little dodgy, but without looking too closely, this is one of the best vamp face turns to this point. I love the way as Darla and Drew terrorize the lawyers, Lindsay looks on with some amusement. Why aren't you afraid? I don't know. You could die here, and you don't care. I care. I guess I just don't mind. Angel's cool. Angel's cut off. Death doesn't bother him because there's nothing in life he wants. It's our desires that make us human. This element of Lindsay's character is terrific, and I wish it had been explored more. Christian Kane's performance has this charismatic melancholy that is pretty interesting and fun to watch. Holland's wife has enough life left in her to invite Angel in, and here we go. Reunion is a ton of fun. Darla's rising makes for a great ticking clock to start the episode that is start to finish impossible to look away from. The episode follows up one of the most memorable gut punches in the series in the trial with yet another. And then somehow, a third one, shocking for very different reasons than the first two. We'll talk about that final firing scene, but even the way it is aesthetically paired with the scene at Holland's home is marvelous. Angel closing in the lawyers is a horror construction high bar on the show. The slow motion, the strings in the soundtrack, and the distant screams are truly harrowing. In contrast, the firing is punctuated by deafening silence. The connections Reunion shares with the rest of the season, the ways in which Angel turn has been set up pretty much since the revamp in season one are all astonishing. A wonderfully constructed fall that has brought actual human emotions to high fantasy and managed to have a little fun even amongst all the sturm and drang of these bloody affairs. On this run through of the show, I've developed a fondness for season two that I never really had before, due in no small part to the crafted detail that flows from episode to episode. Tracking the arc a little bit that has brought us to this point, if there was a thesis established in Judgment, or maybe even going back to Shanshu in L.A., it has been dramatically and beautifully executed upon this season to bring us to this ending. But the episode that most specifically foreshadowed Angel's fall here in Reunion was probably Are You Now or Have You Ever, when, while in a hotel surrounded by paranoid people... <laughs> what do they mean by that? Angel tries to help a woman in trouble who eventually turns on him. Look at his room! Go ahead! I never did get that goodbye kiss. And when given the chance to do the right thing... There's an entire hotel here just full of tortured souls who could really use your help. Help us. Angel, please. People are going to die. Angel chooses darkness. Take them all. And yet somehow, I just can't seem to care. But Angel's moral fall was first mentioned in Tishanshu in L.A., where the phantom of the law firm described Darla as the very thing that was to bring this creature down to us. Completing the first of many interpretations of the phantom of the law firm's phrase, Angel has been brought himself literally down into the basement at Holland's and compromised his ethics. We don't want him dead. We want him dark. 
What Phantom of the Law Firm attempted to accomplish at the end of Season 1, stripping the team away from him, Angel does willingly by the end of Reunion. He has been brought down. Thing is, while Reunion pays off a bunch of beautifully established ideas and foreshadowing, it is on its own an incomplete idea. In Are You Now or Have You Ever, the flashback to Angel's fall is followed by his and Judy's redemption. Can you forgive me? If this has all been an excellent prelude to Angel's fall, the episode itself leaves us with the very big question of what happens, well, after the fall. And I'll be honest, it takes the season a little time to get to it. That coda to parallel Arya Now's final moments doesn't really happen until Reprise and Epiphany. And I think I've realized that that's why my feelings about this episode are at least a little complicated. I've seen Reunion many, many times. It's spectacular. But, and I try really hard never to do this in these videos, I can't help but think about the chunk of episodes coming next. The run to Reunion is one of my favorites in all of Angel the series. The run from here to Reprise is one of my least, a four episode stretch that somehow feels like ten in my head. I'm just saying, the space between now and that two episode season two coda is a bit of a faff. But we'll get to that. Every one of Juliet Landau's Buffyverse appearances in either show are memorable, but this one is even a cut above those. I'm ringing all over. I love Drew's interpretation of the vampire life cycle as being plant-like. The cast-off seed of a previous life planted in the ground, growing from the soil to live, and eventually, in the Buffyverse, become the soil itself again as ash. Pretty great. But I wish it wasn't just in this episode. Darla's resurrection also closes off a bit of her arc that we started in flashback. The Master said he was going to save her soul. Holland said Angel would do the same for her, and he didn't. But as she defends herself from Darla's attack, Drew says pleadingly, Why? I thought it was what you wanted, to be saved. Darla's attack in this scene also reminded me of what Drew did to Angel in Season 2, after Spike kidnapped him. It was always a little bit of a head-scratcher why Drew picked this moment to torture Angel for what he did to her. Don't vampires love being vampires? And wouldn't Drew have had plenty of chances to do it to Angelus over all their time together? But there would have been no point in punishing something that doesn't have a soul and is incapable of guilt. And whether she enjoyed being a vampire or not, Drew died in agony. And in that context, Darla's attack here on Drusilla makes sense. From the beginning, it was Mutant Enemy's desire to have Angel the series live more in the gray area than Buffy does, and that tracks for Angel's fall as well. Things maybe don't appear to be so clear-cut here. Angel didn't abandon a hotel of urchin children to the paranoia demon, but the people he'd been trying to help who repaid his kindness by hanging him. His suggested course of action to Bethany was equally morally dubious. You got the power. Use it. Finish it. Yes, Bethany's dad was a monster. But when Angel says this to her, Bethany already has her villainous father suspended in the air, powerless and helpless. Angel's actions in Reunion are probably the most egregious of the three, as he actually locks the doors to prevent the lawyers from escaping. Though, if you're going to go the path of philosophically justifying his actions at all, he's probably much more justified with the lawyers, given their great potential to cause mayhem with their wealth and power. His decision seems to me self-evidently evil, but we can unpack it a little bit. I've actually read some online defenses of his actions from a loosely utilitarian trolley problem perspective. Let the lawyers be killed, or risk letting them kill many more people. The trolley problem, a turn coined by Judith Thompson in 1976 for an older series of thought experiments, refers to an imaginary scenario in which you are faced with a choice to pull a switch, redirecting a trolley that is hurtling towards five people onto a track where it will mow down just one. Do you pull the lever? One of my favorite explorations of the question was in The Good Place, an episode actually titled The Trolley Problem. But it's a thought experiment that can take many, many forms, perhaps the most common in the 20th century being, if you had a time machine, would you travel back and kill baby Hitler? But we've been pondering the trolley problem in our stories for hundreds of years. It's the question Brutus believed he was answering when he joined in the conspiracy against Caesar. In one of the most famous and affecting Star Trek episodes, Sitting on the Edge of Forever by Harlan Ellison, 
Kirk and Spock chase Bones back to the Great Depression because something he did changed history. As they search for the Doctor, Kirk falls in love with Edith Keeler. Spock discovers that McCoy saved Edith, who will eventually now form a pacifist movement that delayed American entry into World War II, allowing the Nazis enough time to develop nuclear weapons and conquer the world. At the episode's climax, Edith wanders out into the street and Kirk prevents Bones from saving her. Do you know what you just did? He knows, Doctor. He knows. But as much as the trolley problem is an interesting thought experiment, applied to almost any actual practical circumstances, it's easy to see how it represents a false dichotomy. It is too reductive, it assumes too much, and the trolley is on rails, Angel is not. First, there's no way that Angel can be certain as to the future or the culpability of everyone in this room. Earlier in the episode, Holland had been telling Lindsay to make healthy attachments in his life and maybe bring a significant other to the party. For all Angel knows, this person in the background could be Willard. Willard had doubts about his new girlfriend Kathy's job at that weird-ass law firm, but he typically enjoys being the sub in their relationship and didn't feel like his concerns were significant enough to do anything other than reinforce that Kathy should be the one telling him what to do in the bedroom. But though he hasn't admitted it to himself yet. In his heart of hearts, Willard desperately wants to return to Montana with Kathy and spend his days working at the local espresso pump and painting in his free time. But you don't have to go that complicated with the stories of the guests. Holland's wife appears to be suffering when she invites Angel in and he promptly aids in her husband's murder. Given how posh the party is, it seems likely that Angel doomed a caterer to being eaten. Maybe they were an evil caterer? <laughs> Perhaps the morally salient question is where exactly is the punitive line past which Angel can kill punitively? Is it if they've killed someone? He tries to make a very curious distinction earlier in the episode. You don't kill humans. You don't qualify. Why exactly is that? Because Holland has killed? If that's the case, then Angel's redemption is moot because he must have long ago passed the murdery Mendoza line, despite Buffy telling him. You have the power to do real good to make amends. But even if his closing the door on the lawyers was pragmatism and not vengeance, even if you did verifiably know the evil futures of everyone in the room, knowing that future paradoxically means it can't be inevitable. Meaning you don't need to murder a baby to prevent it from becoming Hitler. You could drop that baby off at an orphanage in Sweden with a copy of Wer hat meinen Käse bewegt. Kirk could have taken Edith to the 23rd century and explained to her what was going to happen rather than allowing her death. He did that with the whale lady in the voyage home anyway. And unlike the trolley, Angel isn't on rails, speeding along with no brakes. He had many opportunities in just this episode alone to make different choices. The powers have been trying to change his course since the season began, but the game that Wolfram and Hart has been trying to get him to play since the end of season one is one with limited controlled choices. It's a characteristic of abusers that we talked about with Darla in the water tower scene from Dear Boy. An abuser cultivates scenarios in which every choice their victim makes is a win for them. If Angel succumbed to Darla, she won. If he retaliated against her, she won. Strange game. The only winning move is not to play. Of course, much of this discussion is probably automatically moot, because if Angel's co-murder of the lawyers is in any way justifiable, then this really isn't a fall he's going through, and his arc for the season breaks. The fun of the season's arc, though, is that Wolfram and Hart have never forced Angel to do anything. His moral fall, his soul sickness, occurs as the culmination of his own choices. Just the choices that Wolfram and Hart has presented him with. So, mission accomplished? Maybe? Sort of? Angel's been brought down to the wine cellar and gone dark without losing his soul. That was the plan all along, right, Holland? This time through the series, something has begun to eat at me about the show. Leading with the acknowledgement that episodes have no obligation to be entertaining more than the first time, there are mysteries about the plot that are often masked on first viewing behind sinister vagueness and mustache twirling. As the primary provider of conflict in the series, someone will ask a Wolfram and Hart boss for clarity on what the hell the plan is here. So what is the plan exactly? And what are you expecting him to do? And they'll answer with something sinister and unspecific. We don't want him dead. We want him dark. What he will do. What he must do. 
Save her soul. Cut. And we never go back and revisit, leaving it pretty unclear whether what Holland wanted to have happen, happened. And then periodically one of those bosses eats it. Phantom of the Law Firm in season one, minor spoiler for the next episode, Holland. Holland is the head of special projects. I am division head of special projects. And everything we see him doing here is all about Angel. Special projects like Darla. Well, Darla's just a tool. Means to an end. You're the project. But Holland's face in Reunion distinctly looks like he missed the memo regarding Darla and Drew eating his entire department. Yet, inevitably, a few episodes down the line, someone at Wolfram and Hart goes, Ha ha! It was, that was, uh, uh, exactly as we planned it. Which brings me to a new semi-regular segment I'm going to call... Wait, what was... Whose plan was what again? Okay, so, back in Blind Date, Angel felt an otherworldly call to grab the scroll of aversion containing the Shanshu prophecy. That very scroll also included some sweet, sweet chants that the Phantom of the Law Firm said were needed in order to raise Darla from the dead. The very thing that was to bring this creature down to us, tear him from the powers that be. So, it's implied that the Law Firm does have a very big specific plan for Angel, but it's not explained in the scroll. Only the raising is. Otherwise, Wesley would have found it when they went over the scroll later on. So, okay, bring Angel down to us. I'm just going to refer to it as the bring Angel down plan from now on. In the David Allen getting things done sense of the word that's really more of a project made up of many to-dos than a single executable. Phantom of the Firmament uses the scroll to check the bring back to Darla to-do off the project list. Then he checks off lose a fight to Angel. Busy day for that guy. And then a wild Holland appears. Holland, the anti-Giles. If Giles's role on Buffy is to explain to everyone the lore and history of what's going on, while all along throwing his handsome sexy librarian-ness-ness in our faces, Holland's job is to assure us that there is a design to all of this for sure. But he's not going to tell us what it is. Just look on my bowl cut, ye mighty and despair. For ten episodes, Holland nods knowingly at each event in the season as the tick boxes continue to check off the plan. He seems very clearly informed about the way Darla things are supposed to work. Oh, she's way ahead of schedule. Along with what Lindsay will do about it based on what Holland does and does not show him. He played me. We had to make you believe it, Lindsay. Angel takes Darla to the trials, winning a life, though apparently not hers. Were the trials an intended part of the plan? Holland tells Darla in the bomb shelter that the plan was to have Angel turn her, not go to the trials, so maybe that was someone else. Jasmine. And blooms at night. But I'll get into why that's confusing when we get there. Anyway, in comes Lindsay with a cadre of men and a Drew to turn Darla in front of Angel. Drew and Darla do exactly as Holland asks, participating in a massacre. It just happens that it was Holland's. And voila! All to accomplish the end goal of bring Angel down to us. And that pretty much brings us to right now. Everybody got that? With Angel having fired his team of do-gooders and through some interpretation of the phrase, having been brought down to Wolfram and Hart's level. Playing their game. Doing their dirty tactics. I want him dark. The question still remains... Why? The plan and its purpose have been kept a mystery, not just from Angel and Lindsay, but from us, the audience. So there must be some reason, some nefarious purpose that is going to tie all of this together. If it were simply about an apocalypse, Wolfram and Hart could have saved a lot of time and murderized manpower by just opening a field office in Sunnydale to capitalize on its many apocalypses. So, wait, what was... Whose plan was what again? Unlike the persistent soul canon question in the Buffyverse that I find easy to shrug off, fandom arguments aside, this constantly head-scratchy question in Angel ends up being at least a little relevant to my feeling about the series. By making the end goal of Wolfram and Hart's a mystery, but suggesting that they have a complicated and constructed plan with a clear destination point in mind, the question of what that end point is and why they want it becomes a tiny bit relevant to whether or not the direction of the arc has a satisfying conclusion. The plot begs for not a twist specifically, but a reveal. This will be an evolving conversation that we'll talk about more when we get to Epiphany. Another question that initially had me scratching my head was, why Drusilla? Tracing Holland's plan backwards, it feels unnecessarily dangerous to involve Drew just to turn Darla. Wolfram and Hart must have some back-alley schlub pyre on the books that they could have paid to do it. And many of the consequences for Holland this episode seem at least partially driven by how volatile an element Drew is in the mix. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized it had to be Drusilla. After all... I did a lot of unconscionable things when I became a vampire. Drusilla was the worst. Season 5 of Buffy that runs parallel with Angel Season 2 has put a major emphasis on the idea of chosen family. 
those intimate, loving connections we make either as adolescents or on into adulthood. Chosen, as opposed to the de facto assumed importance of blood relatives. Hank, Buffy's birth father, is nowhere to be found, but Giles, Buffy's chosen, remains steadfast and supportive. They may have their disagreements, but their power dynamic is not a toxic or abusive one, not like Tara and Daddy Gaslights, who stands aghast in one of the most memorable moments in the season when Buffy says of the Scoobies, We're family. Some of my favorite aspects to Angel's second season are the ways in which it, too, explores the ideas of blood versus chosen family, just from a very different perspective. Vampires are blood relatives. Darla refers to Angel as her boy. Untouched literalized that structure by drawing comparisons between Bethany's abusive father and Darla. Drew reestablished those ideas in the episode, Darla. Don't be cross. I could be your mummy. And while tending to Darla's upcoming birth, Drusilla sings Darla a song she once explained in the Buffy episode Lie to Me her own mother had sung to her. She had the sweetest voice. And finally, at the episode's climactic moment. Daddy. From that perspective then, season two of Angel could be read as Angel having to grapple with the siren call of the family he was born into. The one that refuses to acknowledge his growth, his change, and his independence from them. The one that tells him he is all the things he's afraid that he may be. And my boy is still in there and he wants out. And he succumbs. Sure, by the end of the episode, Angel is still sold and not feeding on the lawyers along with Drew and Darla, but resentment and hatred are still a burden that commemorates the abuser, a weight around the neck that maintains their continuing power over their abused. But the wear and tear of the toxic family doesn't doom us to becoming one of them. Bethany's past didn't curse her to her fate, and in the process of defending herself and excising her own monster, Bethany stopped short of becoming one herself. If his toxic relatives are tethers to a version of himself he wishes to be free from, Angel's chosen family in the series have always been his consistent call to the future, to the man that he is capable of becoming. It's about reaching out to people, showing them that there's love and hope still left in this world. You're not him, Angel. Not anymore. He's so sick. You're reflected in the people around you. Not even thinking about his own family. Yeah, redemption is a rocky path. Right now, the three of us are all that's standing between you and real darkness. You're all fired. <laughs>